part about working in the gallery is the um, all the people that I come in contact with. And I am always in love with the students. I love having the contact with the students. And then I continue to meet the most amazing, generous, kind-hearted, talented people. And it, you know, you just cannot have a better job in the world, in my opinion. Um, I had George Goodrich was in a show a uh, year before last when I went to meet with George and select his work. He was at the Art Center of South Florida. And George said, oh, let me show you around. And there are how many artists that have students? 40. George took me around to up, downstairs, in and out of storefronts and everything, introduced me to everyone who was there. I think that, that that's the time that, that you and I met. And, um, and the center is such an energetic, creative, inspiring place. I hope that any time that you all are in Miami, you will um, take the time to benefit yourself by going to visit the art center. Um, it's a jury residency. So there is, I hope that, that you guys will be able to talk a little bit about that journey process, what got you into it. Um, but this exhibition came about by um, first meeting Babette and then, then everybody else was somewhere else at the time. But I came back twice and peered through windows and saw, you know, this magnificent head that Louise had created. And John's paintings just pulled me in and at first you dash by them, which is probably one of your points, um, dashing by, and you get pulled in with this sort of traditional classical palette and then you look at it closer and it's this very interesting everyday kind of world that, that, that needs to be highlighted and remembered. Um, then laws, of course, you, know, you can't you can't walk past laws. Either as the person or as the artist, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, we're very happy to have his work. Juana, um, I think your work was maybe in one of the windows yes. at the time that I saw it. And so um, this, uh, and actually one of our senior project students has been interested in um, these levels that you're creating with the drawings. <laughs> that that's experimentation with color fields and with material and sound material and then um, taking uh, the, the orange and the gray piece that are reminiscent of Rocco, but they're definitely got that first river. Um, just shows you her history as an artist, um, her teaching. Um, everybody has been so welcoming of our invitations and we really look forward to more cooperations. And I do have to hand it to you, these guys, did not say, here, here's my work, take it, go hang it up. They met, they said, all right, here's pictures of the gallery, where do you want to hang, where do you want to hang, they got that all handed out, and then um, Laz was here, Juan was here, Luis was here, you know, they came and they helped install it, it was just, um, it just became a, a community instantly. So I thank you for that, and um, I would like to introduce Mr. Uh, it was me, uh, 
And him helping me uh, 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 teach a painting class on a cruise all across the Atlantic. 14 days of just looking at the sky for one second and then just looking at the ocean for another second. The sky and ocean. Uh, but every class started with a, a, a little song <coughs> on a microphone. Okay. Uh, I'm a really bad singer, so I probably won't say it. Uh, but if you're interested, I think Tom Cruise did it in a Top Gun. Okay. So you know what song I'm talking about? <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I have to really thank you for, for inviting me to, to be part of the show. Uh, and, and, and I'm assuming there's uh, quite a few students here, so uh, any, chance, any chance that uh, an artist or a student, uh, you get a, 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 a chance to show, uh, definitely take it. Uh, but when it's something of uh, really nice quality, I mean, you better jump on it. And this is a beautiful, beautiful space. So again, thank you so much for that. Uh, <clears throat> as far as my work is concerned, um, if you, uh, well, when we break up, we can uh, maybe hang out over there. I'll, I'll definitely talk, talk about it some more. Uh, but I do paint in a, uh, I might say, a represent, representational style in that I'm using um, images that we're used to, right? Uh, images of things that we definitely recognize in everyday life. And what interests me is, um, I got quite a few interests, but um, uh, with this particular picture that you see there, um, there was this, there's a tension between the young couple, uh, and we can't really tell if it's a, a good kind of tension or a bad kind of tension. There's a, there's a family, and certainly at the time that I found this image when we were, uh, I was driving around with my wife, uh, when we uh, were, we're almost going to have that the big one, the, the <laughs> uh, uh, I remember, obviously, that's the fresh in our head, and uh, uh, you know, us talking about uh, possibly our right, our family. So that's definitely something that my eyes were were looking for. Uh, but uh, my eyes were also looking just like a bug is attracted to light. These little gnats that are attracted to light. Uh, we were driving around and we saw a animal. And we, uh, we went in there and we stopped in there. And again, I saw, as soon as we walked in, I saw this couple. And again, I don't know body language wise, are they good or are they bad? And I like that little tension that was a, that's part of what, what that story might be. And certainly we could bring uh, whatever we want to it as a viewer. And uh, I enjoy that. I enjoy being able to uh, play with that idea so that the viewer becomes part of, of, of the painting. All right? But again, ask me any questions in a little while. I'm sure I'll talk to you here also. All right? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Hi, uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, my name is Luis Garcia Ray, and um, uh, I'd like to thank Annika <coughs> as well for the opportunity to show here. And, I'm a big fan of all these artists here or peers, but I'm also a fan because I, I love art and uh, I enjoy everything that they do. Uh, my piece is uh, Indian Head. Uh, its name is Cacique. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a name that, that uh, is from the Taino, uh, which is um, <coughs> it's, uh, Indian culture from uh, the Antilles. Um, and it's part of my culture, uh, Cuban, or culture, or Indian culture. Um, but that's not that piece. But anyway, I, I enjoy using a lot of raw materials. Um, I do a lot of sculpture, but I also do a lot of paintings. My paintings are as raw as that. Um, a lot of my projects have to do with, you know, reuse or refound materials. Um, in that case, or in this case, um, it's all made of um, found wood and uh, paintings that I actually recycled um, and cut up. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of cardboard, as you can see. Um, the top of it has uh, an old piano that I used to have and, uh, that I cut up. I think one of, the, one, of the, one of those pieces of wood you can see a, a star. It says star, and it's a little star piano. Um, but yeah, I've been in the art center for six years. I grew up in Miami, and, um, and uh, I show in different galleries and do different projects. Um, but 
for the past couple of years, I've been doing a project called uh, Babylon, uh, which is going to different parts of the country or different parts of it are outside the country. So far, I've done Miami, New York, and Puerto Rico. Uh, and what I do is I spend a month there and I gather materials uh, for about a couple weeks. And uh, I build these cities. After two weeks, I gather all these materials, uh, discarded wood, anything I can find. Uh, and I interact with you know, the public, and that's part of the process. And then I create these cities. And um, I have all the materials. And uh, so I really enjoy uh, not only this type of uh, thing where I can you know, dip my work, but the process itself is like what I pretty much enjoy the most is making the work, being in the studio, and then, you know, working with other artists to collaborate and do these great shows. Um, so yeah, that's that's, that's me. Yeah. that 
my identity was being recorded, right? So I remember getting that green card, and I remember this moment where we had to take this picture, and it's a three-quarter view picture, and you have to, you know, expose your ear, take any any you know earring off that you have there, and the ear is used as an identifying mark. It's called a biometric, the same way that you use your fingerprint, right? The ear is actually a more exact biometric than a fingerprint, which is pretty amazing to me, right? And this sort of experience of going through all of that system and seeing the way that an identity is collected, right? Stay with me. Stay with me. I then went to art school, uh, made all these paintings. You know, that was in Chicago. I moved a lot in the US as well. Then actually went back to Miami and actually was at the art center 10 years ago. So then I went to grad school and I went out to Los Angeles. I was there for 10 years. And I did a lot of work, if you go on my site and you see my work, I did a lot of work about exploration of identity in LA, um, that particular site, et cetera, et cetera. And you can look that, you know, you can take a look at that. But the point is that what you see here, so I moved to Miami a year ago, a year and a little bit ago. And what you see, this actually I think is the the most actually complete work I have done that is a complete break from the work I was doing in LA. And it's very much an exploration of place and site of Miami, thinking about this city that I'm back in um, and thinking about what the identity is about for me. For me, all of this, all of this imagery is filtered through uh, security systems. I'm very interested again in that identity and how that's constructed. So, um, you know, being in Little Havana and looking at the little, uh, the little food carts and looking at all this kind of stuff, looking at these megaphones and security cameras and images that are being recorded and collected. So my work is very much about this kind of exploration of identity, you know, of place. And so that's that's what you see as this kind of combination of this kind of experimentation. Also, it's very much about drawing, like the actual media of drawing. I, I love drawing. I love that I can come to this gallery and finish the, the piece here on site, right, by adding this, this drawing on the wall, and next time I install it, it'll be different. So that's a big part of my work as well, the actual media of drawing and making this environment. And actually, I love that, having that in my hand, that I can just take that pencil and just make a mark anywhere. I think that is the most powerful thing. And we're, we, the awesome thing about it is that we are all you know, we, we all start by drawing, right? Then we write and all that kind of stuff, but we all have that um, power, and I, I just, I love that about that meeting. So, it's about, my work is about a lot of things. It's all these ideas, but then again, it's just the love of color and drawing and the actual materials themselves. So, that's, that's what I do.
Uh, it worked out really well. He was very happy and he was generous, generously, uh, he was so happy with it, he was generously gave me another project for, uh, for the restaurant, which was to produce uh, uh, seating for it. So basically, these two series of work for me actually came out of the same client or the same uh, project. Um, this time, the project, uh, the budget for the project was a little bit more than the life. Instead of being a dollar, it was a dollar and a half. Um, so, driving around the city, uh, Babette and I, uh, we were actually looking for space uh, together to be working at a, at a warehouse, uh, a pure warehouse space. And within in City Man, we have an area called Little Haiti, and uh, very industrial, um, with a lot of opportunities uh, for manufacturing for manufacturing there. And we came across this place that was producing uh, bundled clothing for the Caribbean market. Uh, what they do is they hand select clothing that would sell either in Haiti, some of the mingle, um, all the Antilles, uh, and. Uh, and when you walk in there, it's about a 10,000 square foot of space with mountains of clothing that is donated uh, from uh, your donations to Goodwill and uh, Salvation Army. Um, Goodwill and Salvation Army actually pre-selects what they want to sell. And what they don't like gets basically trucked in or, or trained in from all around the country to these places in Little Haiti. Um, then the, the workers there are actually pre-pick again what is the best of what got shipped to them and discard the rest to our night Um When this project came to me, uh, I went back to this, uh, to this place and was looking at these bundles and automatically I looked at them as seating elements. Uh, spoke with the management and uh, for several days out of the month, Hand selected out of the pile that's going to go to the landfill, uh, the best ones to make the seating elements out of. Uh, and while all of this is happening, they don't stop working. So I have to sort of work with the time period or the time scheduling of this of these workers of this manufacturer. And so anytime they take a break, I'm able to jump into their press and actually, uh, with their assistance, press down one of these chairs. So it's. it's it's like, like this, okay, I've got five seconds, get in there, do it, right, okay, this is coming out good. And if it doesn't come out good, well, too bad, that's how it is. <laughs> and, uh, and which is beautiful, because those slight uh, imperfections is what I think brings character to the piece. Um, so anyways, it got done, the restaurant opened up, it closed several weeks later. <laughs> uh, hopefully not because of the decor. <laughs> Uh, but then it set me off on this entire new tangent of work, which is using sustainable materials or discarded materials and ups, uh, upscaling them or upcycling them to new purposes. Um, and uh, that's really about it. Um, generally, as, as I said, I'm, I don't consider my work art. I understand other people do, and maybe one day I'll look at it that way. Um, I do see it as products. I do see them as objects, um, and I think in my work that sort of like, defines me a little differently from other people. And I do, in my own body of work, in the future body of my work, I do hope to, to gain what these three amazing artists have already accomplished in their work, is this level of spontaneity, this level of emotional depth, which I still feel and uh, that I need to grow towards. Uh, so that's. Me. <laughs> okay, I'm going to prompt our group with a few questions and then we'll turn it over to you to ask them as well. And I'd like to continue with uh, what Professor Ed was talking about, which is uh, the interaction with the everyday, the common, the, the discarded. And we can see how that has changed your work, but how has it changed you? The interaction with the, so not just for you, but to all of you, how has that interaction between the everyday, seeing it in a more poetic manner, how has that changed you as, as people? What have you gotten from that? I'll leave it to you, Zach. Well, I think for me, it's, it's, it hasn't changed me. I think I, I was always that way. You know, I think for many of us in the realm of the creative, yourself included, very much who we are as adults, 
that nucleus was there as a child. I once sat in a round table with friends and we talked about what we did, how we played when we were kids. The jeweler played jewelry store, et cetera, et cetera. We were doing those, those things that our personality and our psyche attaches to when we're young. If we're fortunate enough, we can hang on to those things and play with them as adults. Um, it's how I entertain myself. I take so much pleasure in the mundane, which for me, of course, is not mundane, but I'm very grateful often. It's a very conscious piece of gratitude that I have for being able to entertain myself pretty easily with the world around me. Just And find beauty in a stick that's falling from a tree. I mean, here in Florida, we are lucky to have this amazing fauna that dry, falls, dries and falls to the ground, but it's sculptural. It's amazing. So, it's, it's something unfortunate to do. I have to say that I haven't been a traditional painter for so long. It's really amazing to work with these materials, especially the cardboards, because they're free. I'm not <laughs> spending a great deal of money to have large-scale panels made, or, or, for example, this yellow piece, Les actually is the person who built it for me. That, that costs some serious dollars, so it's pretty interesting to work with material that's literally free, although that's not the impetus to do it. It's just um, it's beautiful and it's there. <laughs> I work with a lot of recycled material. And for me, I mean, it's both. The free part is, is, is great because obviously, I mean, a lot of the materials that you find are, you know, you gather, you're finding, and you're creating, you can make. Uh, for me, it's what the interesting part about the whole thing is, is a couple of things. The interaction that I have once I'm gathering these things with, with uh, Public, you know, um, when I'm talking to people and, and we're going back and forth, and they don't seem to understand what I'm using it for, and I try to explain it to them, and uh, and you know, it just they don't see it the way I the way I see this, this piece of material that I'm gathering, uh, and then they see the, the process and they see what I do with it. So that, that's rewarding for me. Um, um, yeah. Besides that, I mean, how it's ch how it's changed me. Well, I think that, that alone that has allowed you to have those interactions. Yeah. That's that, that fantastic. Yeah. It adds up also a, like a conceptual depth to the piece as well. You know, because it, it adds, uh, for at least in my mind, it adds a little bit of depth to it. Because uh, you're using a, you know, an untraditional you know, material to create these pieces. Like, like, it seems like they were all the but also, I think there is a life to this piece, be it a can or, or a bundle of something or materials that you can recognize. There's a life that already existed, yeah. and it, there is a reinterpretation of what's going on. Yeah, it's kind of, and, and for me, it's like a problem solving, too. You know, when you gather these things, and you're, you, you see the beauty in them, and then you have to figure out how to create something out of it. And uh, that, that, that part of it is. It's very fascinating. Just problem solving that maybe something. I think uh, uh, with me, it kind of started with this question of uh, sort of as we get older, uh, wanting to uh, know a little bit about who the heck I am. And quite honestly, it started as a joke, uh, but it really, it, it really morphed into something kind of serious. And that I thought, well, I can't afford a psychologist. So I'm just gonna paint, <laughs> and I'm gonna figure out what it is, uh, you know, whatever I'm painting about is gonna tell me something about me. But seriously, in that process, I realized that uh, I'm not that unique. You know, um, I think we're kind of sort of some of the things that I've ever saying. It's like um, I, I'm sharing this with the world, but you know, this image is the world that's in it too. So we're kind of in this together, you know, and. Um, so I first started as an ego thing, and so like, who are the heck am I? And then realized, wait a minute, there's a whole set of people behind me looking at these images too, you know? And so it, it's, it's sort of a way of, who am I, but who are we as well? And in some uh, strange way, uh, I kind of think of art as being sort of a mirror to our culture, you know? So uh, not only am I looking at myself and what I'm attracted to paint, uh, but suddenly those that those that like my work um, may have that same feeling, um, uh, but uh, even those that may not connect with it 
can obviously understand the word uh, uh, readily. You know, it's uh, you know, it's a car, a truck, uh, people walking. You know, so it's like, oh yeah, I've been there. I've been there. I, uh, I get what you're saying. So it's 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 that feeling of this usness, right? It's us. Is that a new word? Usness. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have to say, I think something that you said really resonated with me, which is that I feel lucky also that I can be able to hang on to um, just this making, you know, like that. And I, I, I really am very aware of that, you know, because again, like all of you make or have made stuff, right? And you know how it is. Like your life gets very busy, et cetera, and there's so many things that are pushing you to do other things, right? And, uh, I think being able to hang on to that making in any way. And to be honest, uh, you know, a lot of the way that my work is installed and the way that it's transported has a lot to do with that. They're just tactics on, I can roll this stuff out and I can make this big impact, this big installation, or, you know, even bigger, just by, but I can roll it out. And I, I just, you know, I just ship something else. And I have taken stuff in my suitcase so many times. And, you know, anyway, but this idea of, like, you find ways of, of, you know, just retaining your, being able to make at any cost. I think that that's like so important, you know, so, anyway. Anything else? No. Okay. <laughs> Not a problem. Everyone said it really well. Yeah, so that's great. Thank you for all of your responses. Um, I think for our audience, and, and maybe for myself as well, could you speak a little bit more about what it means to create site-specific work for those of you who are attuned to that? And also, what does it mean to create a site-specific exhibition as a collaborative group? Because you all did weigh in on this in some, so if you could elaborate a little bit more on that experience and what that means to see the height, the ceiling and the floor as the frame versus the frame as the frame. Well, I mean, I, I do a lot of site-specific installations, and um, for me it's, uh, it's a wonderful experience because uh, you work with, with the space and, uh, and you walk in, at least the way I, I go about it is that, you know, I see the space and I envision, you know, what I could do with it, so if I could split it or if I should hang something from here or there and um, how to break it up so that, it, so that it, it, it gets to the place that I was in. Um, so, you know, I get off on, on doing that. Perhaps not with, with this piece here, it's, it's, a, it's a hanging sculpture. Um, but like I, I've done exhibitions and a lot of them where it's, it changes the, the physicality of the room. Um, Can you describe the piece you just did uh, in Miami? Oh, the Latino yeah. piece. Yeah, so. Um, That's good. Yeah, so excellent. So I, I recently. Uh, for this past year, I had a show at a gallery called Amber Gino Gallery. And they changed the name. It's the name. <laughs> but anyhow, um, I was, they, they liked my work and what I've done, so they asked me to come in and you know, sort of pitch them an idea on what I'd like to do in this room. So um, I, was, I went to, to the space, and for whatever reason, I, um, I wanted to, to, to do a, a, an experiment with uh, you know, being maybe in two places at the same time. So I was like, okay, so how do I figure, how do I do that? You know? So I looked at the space, it was uh, maybe half of this room, or a long ways maybe, or a quarter of it, I'm not sure. But, so what I did was, um, I did a, uh, a fake ceiling in the space uh, at like 10 feet high. The, 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 the original ceilings were maybe 15 feet high. And at 10 feet, I made a fake ceiling, meaning I, you know, I was completely white. Walked into this room, and and the whole room was completely white, almost as if it was empty. Well, it wasn't, but it wasn't. So you walked into this room, it was completely empty. And then on each side of the rooms, there was these holes that I made in the ceiling, white, and then this hole like that here, on each side. And there was these uh, steps that I created right below. And the point was for the viewer to come in and climb the steps and put their head through the ceiling. 
So <laughs> when you put your head to the ceiling, you're standing on a platform and you have your head to the ceiling because that's all it fits. And when you put your head to your ceiling, it was a complete forest on the top. Okay. Uh, meaning I created like really realistic trees and uh, pine needles in the whole thing. It was all lit up inside. And um, so that's an example of like a site specific, at least for me, that's an example of site specific. It was for that, that space. So in that show, um, there was two things going on. There was not only were you as a viewer going up and putting your head through and see, and being somewhere, two places at the same time, basically. But the viewer from, from the bottom part, was interesting, was that you're experiencing that person putting their head through the ceiling. So you walk into this empty white room and you see a person standing with their head through the ceiling. So it was, it was pretty funny, it was, it was fun, it was active, interactive. So at least when I do, that's what it, for me, you know, what um, it means to do site specific work. So, um, if I can talk about the current exhibit uh, that we're all part of. Um, as you've heard already, we're, I'm sitting here at this table with some amazing job jobs, okay? They create amazing work, and um, how do we equally give uh, credit to the work that, that these marvelous artists have, have done equally within a space? I mean, look at Luis's uh, uh, Indian piece. Uh, amazing. It, it, will, it will just, you cannot stop staring at it, okay? Uh, same with Babette. <laughs> Her, her work just illuminates, and you're attracted to it. John's, like a moth, like originally the, the concept, uh, you're just so attracted to that white space in his, in his uh, painting, you just can't stop staring at it. Juan and the Juanitas, it's, it just says so much, so simply, that you have to give credit. And it just takes, it takes up its space. It takes the room. It, it, it's just a wonderful piece. So you have all this work, and how do you make it work equally within a space. And so when we're talking about, we met earlier, um, how to cover up the space, how to give each one uh, enough working space for the work to shine. Um, we felt that by dividing the space into equal parts, uh, really give no one other artist more space than the, uh, than the other. Um, generally one wall per artist um, worked out the best. And I know this is all academic and I'm kind of stupid to talk, but um, just to let you know that there is some thought that goes prior to just putting up a show. We have we want to give the work its its proper due and its and its uh, uh, and make each piece showcase as best as possible. Um, in this case, you can see that there's two yellow pieces directly across from each other, and and that's on purpose. Um, if they were any closer. It would just been visually too, uh, too just the vibration between the two would just be too strong. Uh, uh, by separating them across the room, I think it helped to balance. Um, and the same as we did with Juanitas and with Luis. And uh, that's really about it. Just to give you a little background for how the show is set up. Any other comments on that? You've already heard my little story about the pencils, so yeah. you know. <laughs> um, at this point, we're about 10 minutes left, so I'd like to open it up to the audience and ask you if you have any questions for the artist. Um, Juanita, since you're here at the collective, I was wondering if you talk about that experience of working like in a studio together. Why did you choose to work in a residency? Like, it's in the ceramic studio, I'm always preaching to them
what I really uh, like about the process of getting in is that it's a random, uh, what is it, 40 artists essentially? All right. So there's a random uh, choosing of artists. And we all work in very different modes, right? So uh, the random choosing, uh, they get into a, a room and they see the incoming of uh, those that want to come in. Uh, what I like about it is that it's, it, when I got in, it's, it's, I knew that I was uh, judged by peers. So it's almost an instant, uh, uh, you know, an instant kind of uh, respect, uh, an instant like, okay, you know, I don't know who chose me because it's a, uh, you don't get to really find out. Uh, but I tell anybody like, hey, I chose you. But, uh, <laughs> You don't really know, but so you kind of feel this uh, affinity towards uh, everybody around, and, and, and we all have uh, wait, like 24 hour, 24 hour access, of course. So we all have different working times. Um, uh, some of us are you know, social butterflies that walk around and you know uh, talk to people, and other people are more uh, you know staying in their studio and, uh, and, and create some awesome work. Um, uh, but yeah, but you know, some it just depends, I guess. Like anyone else, like in your personality, as far as who you are, you know, and there's like there's an inbuilt respect uh, for each other because we all chose each other at some point. You know, we all chose each other to be there, um, and it's exciting. It's exciting. It really is. I look for uh, last time I was in, um, on the jury. Uh, I was excited about the person I chose. It's like I couldn't wait to see the work in person because you only see it up on the screen. So it was kind of selfish on my point. Like, yeah, I, I want to. And you kind of have little arguments and fights. Like, no, no, this person needs to be here. And, and, and it's kind of, it's kind of fun. It really is really kind of fun. But I, you know, I, I am kind of here. You're big. I, I think something that's really great about being in a residency is that you know that there's, you know, all these great artists that, yes, do different things, but we have a common vocabulary. And that's so valuable because um, there's that respect. And so you can, let's say, find you know, an artist down the hallway and you know, ask, you know, I'm, I'm sending this installation and I need a, another set of eyes. And that's incredibly valuable. Whereas if you are off on your own, you, know, you don't have that resource. So I think that that is huge. You really do trust them. They're, they're a huge resource for you. Um, so that's a huge thing about being uh, being in a residency. You're also inspired by other people's work, their work ethic, their projects. Um, that's huge. So that community aspect of it is, is very valuable. I think one thing that's really amazing about being in a, a residency is it's sort of an extension of school. It's sort of the studio experience you have in school brought into the broader part of your life. You're not in a bubble. You can be in a bubble if you want to be in a bubble for half a day or two days in a row because you can just sit close to the door. But you're not in a bubble. You can think and act and get help from and give advice to that that's going on around you. The other thing that I think for me that's, been, that's made it really important is that it is going to work. I like to refer to my studio as, as work. I, I like to refer to it, especially to the non-creative people in my world this is my job, this is my work, this is my life's work. And it formalizes that for me, and it helps me stay on point, it helps me stay more productive, it gives me a little more structure to my world that might not be there if I were just working out of perhaps where I lived, or maybe singularly over in some little warehouse. So I draw a lot from it, and not so sure, I've always worked communally, so I'm not so sure how I would do if I worked separately. <laughs> Another question? No? Yes? I'm just kind of curious. I think if you, you talked about um, having done art school, could you speak a little bit about the transition from being an art student to becoming a professional artist? You know, where, where do you, I guess, focus your inspiration or energy? In, in moving forward, you know, because um, a lot of these young people here in this room are our students, and maybe they're going to try and do a career in art, or maybe just have a hobby in art, or whatever, and then other people are maybe, you know, pursuing it and doing something else completely. 
professionally or you know, can you talk a little bit about that, how you made that transition? Because I find it personally just I can't keep my brain around that. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I think there's a um, I think we may have all unique stories as to how we became artists. Uh, and um, it's it's incredible that at least I'm not gonna go into my story, but uh, I, you know, I, I get, uh, as a student, I was uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, looking for how to make it as an artist, you know? <laughs> and all these million formulas. You know, make sure you do this, make sure you do that, make sure you do this, and, and for every single formula that I've read uh, or tried, I've seen the opposite succeed. For example, uh, uh, I knew an artist who was making uh, Hollywood, a great book. And uh, here I am uh, thinking, well, I gotta get my images right. In other words, when you when you have a, a, a portfolio, you wanna make sure that those are perfect. You're gonna be sending these things out, so people are gonna uh, show you stuff. But again, I knew this artist has his images were horrible, but the work in person was beautiful. And he was making a hell of a work. I think, for me, um, there's a little bit, of, uh, you know, how about the PC about this? Uh, there's a little bit of laziness, and I'll explain why lazy, uh, and a little bit of ignorance in that uh, if I look at my life and if I look at people that love me and, and, and uh, that, uh, you know, my family, uh, you know, they definitely gave me it, uh, art, you know, yeah, sure, just do it on the weekends or <laughs> do it at night, right? And, um, and I believed them for a long time. I was like, yeah, yeah, art, yeah, yeah, art. It's something that I should do on the weekends because I didn't have the resources to just be in the studio all the time. Um, but something clicked eventually, and I just kept showing up to the studio, and I just kept painting. And there's a life will definitely get in the way, and life kept telling me, stop, stop doing this, stop picking up that brush. But I was a little lazy to stop and do, you know. Fill out a resume, and then I get a real job. I was just a little like, eh. and quite frankly, uh, I think there was a little bit of uh, a little, little ignorance, and and, I'm, and I say ignorant, but I really mean it in a positive way, in that I refuse to believe, um, man, say the truth that I shouldn't be doing this. I was like, oh well, well I'm going to do it anyway, and the hell with it. So I just kept doing it, I kept doing it, I kept doing it. And you know what? Um, some good things have come out of that. You know, just literally just showing up to the studio and doing it. And there again, there's a million theories, a million things telling me I shouldn't do it this way, I should do it that way. There's a million books on how to do this, and there's a million videos on how to do this, and they're all wonderful. But at the end of it, like, I just kept showing up, and I was just too lazy to go do something else. <laughs> that, that, that's it, and, and, and it's worth it. And I'm able to take care of my family, so I'm very happy. Okay, here's from a different personality. So we can see a bunch. Just different, you know, hey. I do think what you what John said about showing up is key. Like if you do not put the time into that studio and into that work, you just forget it. So that I a hundred percent agree. It is about showing up. Um, the other thing I think, and I hear this all the time, but I think this is true, your core, your peers, having like going out of school and having that group that will that is also an artist and is also trying to figure it out with me, for me it was so important. And I've seen it with other friends of mine. That was my um, that you, know, you can, everybody is, they're either they're trying to show somewhere, they're uh, trying to make work, but they're trying to make that living in some, you know, whether it's teaching or whatever, or selling their work, whatever it is. But having that core for me was so important because if you go out of school and you don't have that support system, I, I, I just don't know how that, you know, how that would work. So for me, that, that's what I would say. And yes, making that time to show up and make that work. I actually think that being a professional artist, which all of us are um, here, is a lot of work. And it is, you have to be 50 times more professional, I think, um, than 
than you know other professions. And I say that because uh, you know you have to if you think about it, you know the stereotype of the artist is that they're flaky, they're twitter. Let me tell you, being an artist is a lot of work. You have to be there, you know, make sure that that person gets together, make sure that again this is another personality, right? Um, and your statement is together, share it with people, have that pitch, you know, like this is what I do, and I do it super fast, like my work is about bam, 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 bam. It's just repeat it, and you know, either, even if you don't believe it just yet, you know, just be clear, like it's just one sentence, hey, what's your work about? I do this, boom, this is what I do. You just know it, you own it. So, I don't know, that's that's how I have seen it, that, that's, that's how I've experienced it. But again, that core group, I think, is really important. Well, what is professional? That's actually, a, to me, an even more interesting and important question. Because you could have a 60-hour-a-week job mowing lawn somewhere, but you could still be a professional artist. <laughs> professional, to me, is getting rid of what one does. You don't become an Olympian or a, a really terrific musician without doing. So I'm on board with these guys. The person who continues to do, absolutely at some point becomes a professional. Whether they let anyone see it or not is up to them. It doesn't diminish it if it's kept in a binder or all over the walls of their home. It can still be professional. Um, it's like water. A, leap, a roof of the leap, it finds its way. If you, if you love what you're doing enough, if you're doing the right thing, you will love it. If you do it enough, it will find its way. And um, if you don't love it enough, find something you love to do because it won't sustain you. You have to love what you do as a creative person because it takes so much effort to help it find its way. It's not easy, but it never feels like work, even though it is. It is all about doing, doing, and doing, doing. And if you don't want to do it every day, all day long, that's okay. But if you keep doing it, you will get very good what you choose to do. I think that was a great moment to close on. Thank you for that. That was very poetic, beautifully said. I'd like to thank once again our five artists. They will be here for the next hour, hour and a half, maybe longer. So please feel free to talk to them. So please thank them again.